Chapter 28 The Scrounger's Tale Morning broke like a file of mercury. More greed, more scroungers, said Shariart one morning. All day long I listened to men pleading for a judgment, caging for money, begging for mercy, asking for their lives. They all want something from me, Scheherazade, and you are no better. Scheherazade rose from sleep as a pearl diver rises to the surface. What have I done, my wakeful, persecuted lord? For if it is anything I can put right, tell me immediately. Oh, I know you have never pleaded for your life in so many words, grumbled Charyar, but your stories pled to be heard, and your beauty pleads to be preserved. You know my life is entirely at your disposal, my most beset lord, judge of all living judges. Sentence me to live or die according to your pleasure. But if Allah, to his amazement, finds me still alive tonight, I could tell you the story of a magnificent scrounger, and you would hear his side of the argument. But perhaps it would offend you to hear of such wickedness from the mouth of a sponger. King Shariar decided in his mind to hear the scrounger's tale, and thought to himself, Perhaps if I hear the cadger's point of view, I shall be better able to like the people who creep and cringe round my throne every day. So on the seven hundred and seventy-seventh night, Scheherazade began. Tufel the sponge lived entirely by scrounging. He caged all his meals at the houses of friends, or should I say acquaintances, for quite soon he had no friends left. He borrowed money for absolutely, positively, unquestionably the shortest of times and best of reasons, but somehow the loans were never repaid. But I must tell you this story in the words of Tufel himself, for how can I, an honest believer in a mere woman, understand such people? They call me Tufel the Sponge because I soak up their food and money, but truly there is such meanness in the world these days that anyone wringing out this sponge at the end of the day will find it quite dry. Take, for example, my noble and esteemed friend Khalifa al-Walid. He gave a dinner the other night for a few friends and served a table of fish dishes worthy of the greatest cook among the mermaids. There was far too much for so few to eat without discomfort and indigestion, so I thought it was my duty to go along and help eat up the meal. I suppose al Walid recognized my voice as I spoke to his doorkeeper, for when I entered the dining room there was much shuffling of plates going on. There was only one empty chair by the table, and all the smallest, most miserable-looking fish had been arranged on the plates within reach of that chair. Someone had seen me coming, I thought to myself, and sat down in the empty chair with a cheerful smile. I touched nothing, none of the food, except for a stick or two of celery and a crust of bread. I noticed that the fattest, greasiest, most delicious fish had been tucked away on the far side of the table, and no believer with manners may reach across the table, as you know. "'You seem to have lost your appetite,' said Al-Walid, thinking he had insulted me so successfully that I would not visit him again in a hurry. "'I have to admit to a certain loathing of fish, O mighty Khalifa. Ever since my father drowned in the sea, I have never been able to stomach a sea fish. These savage beasts on the table probably ate him, after all.' "'Surely this is a perfect opportunity to avenge yourself,' joked Awalid, knowing full well that my, cam my father had been hanged for stealing seventy-four camels. "'Perhaps you are right,' I exclaimed, and picked up from the smallest, most bony, fleshless twig of a sprat from the plate nearest me. Holding it up to my ear, I rattled it with a little. "'Do you know what this little fellow says?' I cried, leaping to my feet. But all all Walid, all but all Walid, were now quite spellbound and their jar jars dropped. Well, how should we know unless you tell us? It says, I'm far too young to have been e eaten your father, but if you want revenge, look to those big fat mullets lolling on that plate over there, that plate beside the noble Khalifa's hand, for they are the very fellows that gobbled up your father. Then all Walid, may Allah bless him for a mean, cunning old buzzard and as big a rogue as I am, he laughed so hard that he fell off his chair, and when he had picked himself up, he set the biggest red mullet in front of me. It was so big that it hung off either side of the plate and said, Heat it, enjoy it, and I hope it gives you indigestion for a week. Your tongue's as slippery as any fish on this table. So we shook hands and ate until three in the morning. Such greedy gluttons deserve each other's company, said such greedy gluttons deserve each other's company, said Charyar. I enjoyed your story, but I hate people who keep their brains inside their stomachs like the octopus. As the poet says, I do not live to eat as the, does the glutton, who stuffs himself with bread and meat and pies, for when the glutton finds his way to heaven, the gates are all too small to take his size. That is perfectly true, said Scheherazade thoughtfully. Greedy people never reach a happy ending. Take the example of the fox in the story of the crow and the fox. 
He ate so much that he emptied a whole valley of everything that ran, crawled, flew, or jumped. "'Is this another of your stories told in the animal language, Scheherazade?' said King Shariar, already determined to postpone her execution another day to hear that story. "'If the new day spared me to see moonlight again,' she replied, "'I would speak it in Arabic for your delight and convenience.'" Chapter 29 The Crow and the Fox A story is told, although only the animals can tell if it is true, of a greedy fox who retired to live in a secluded valley with his wife and children, but he ate so ravenously anything that ran, crawled, flew, or jumped, that soon there was nothing left alive in the valley but the fox and his family. It was then necessary to eat his wife fox and all the little children foxes. After they had all been digested, the fox grew quite desperate and decided he would have to leave the valley. Unfortunately, old age, which eventually chews on all all his creatures, chewed on the fox's bones and made them ache when he ran. His sensitive nose, having smelled more smells than the dustbins of Baghdad, was clogged with dust, sand, and pollen, and the pads of his paws were as hard as stone. When his stomach had been empty for a whole day, the fox said to himself, "'This is a tragedy for an animal of my rank. Steps must be taken.' His steps took him to the foot of a tall acacia tree, where, from the topmost branches, a crow was scanning the countryside. "'If I can persuade this scrawny, evil-faced, sin-colored bird to work for me,' thought the fox, "'I can save myself a great deal of running. She can fly ahead of me and spy out dead rabbits and knock-kneed chickens. Then, if her directions are good, I shall peck her the bones after I've eaten my fill.' So he polished his tongue on the inside of his cheeks and said, in words as slippery as ice, "'Oh, most fair-faced free-flying bird of the blackest wings, more purple-black than purple-black raven, the golden curve of your beak is more beautiful than the new moon against the blackest night sky.' "'Ock, ock, ock!' said the crow, laughing until she was hanging upside down by her feet. "'That's the funniest thing I've heard since the scarecrow saw my brother die of fright.' What was the purpose of that poetical outburst, you foul-faced, flat-footed fool of a fox? Before you insult me, sweetest eagle of the morning sky, said the fox, and the smile on his mask never wavered. You ought to hear of a wonderful plan I have for our future lives together. What's this, a proposal of marriage? Put your cunning back between your teeth and your bald brush back between your legs and remember the words of the poet. Let every creature keep to his own, those who are eaten and those who eat. For if all intends all beasts to be friends, why did he give the lion its teeth, and why is the tiger never flown? But the fox did not give up. Your wisdom and education convince me that all the more of the wonderful good we could gain from knowing one another. Let me compose a verse now in praise of your ravishing left wing. Oh, fox, oh, flea farm, oh, liar of lies, a crow has never trusted a fox before today, and I don't intend to be the first. I don't know what you want, but you are like the vulture in the story, and I won't help you. I don't know the story of the vulture, said the fox, so the crow told it. There once was a vulture so ravenous and cruel that he emptied the sky around him. The little birds took to walking on the ground rather than fly in the claws of the vulture, but even there they were not safe, for he stooped out of the sun and mangled many a delicate bird, biting off its head and with one closing of his beak. But all things grow old except for time itself. The vulture's baldness spread to the very tip of his tail, and his dragging wings raveled on the ground, and his beak rotted on his nose, and then he blustered and stormed at the little birds who flew overhead and the chickens who pecked grain right up to the edge of his shadow. Bring me, you foo bring me food, you nest for a thousand fleas. But having known him for a lifetime, no bird went near him. This was not through fear, you understand, for there was nothing left to fear. The vulture was simply beneath contempt. But they had watched out for him when he was young, and they scorned to notice him when he was old, and he crumbled into a heap of feathers and bone, which blew away in the next sandstorm. The crow's words fell out of the tree onto the fox like so many pebbles, but none of them bruised his hard heart. He went on relentlessly. Crow among crows, I can understand this wise and worldly argument, every word chosen with the care of a brilliant storyteller. But when you hear my plan, you are certain to change your mind, just as the weather clock is certain to turn when the wind changes direction. Listen, my days of rabbit eating are over, and I shall not stand for another frog leaping around in my digestion. What separates the hill from the mountain, the duck from the eagle, the tribe of fox from the tribe of wolf? ambition. Together, you and I will ambush Mankin when he passes by with his caravans of five hundred camels, with his wife riding in a silk palanquin. I shall tear out his throat, and then stand aside while you feast on his eyes and tongue. 
The fox roared wheezily and stretched to his full height against the acacia tree, but it only served to display his hungry ribs sticking through his skin like the frame of a worn-out tent. "'Wreck of a fox!' said the crow. "'Go to a river bank and look in. "'If you are fortunate, the mangy fox you see in the water "'may tell you the story of the sparrow, "'and you would do well to learn from it.' "'You tell it, oh masterful storyteller,' said the fox, "'his ears beginning to crumple. "'Very well, old furry bones. "'There was once a sparrow who lived in a field "'where a farmer kept his sheep. "'Once in a while, the sparrow would see a great golden eagle "'hurtle down and seize one of the sheep with its massive talons, "'carry it off to the mountains, fleece, meat, and hooves.' The sparrow said to himself, I am as good as any eagle, I shall do the same. So he spiraled up on eager, ambitious wings to a height where the thin air whistled in his throat. Then he plunged down onto the back of a big woolly ram, the biggest of the flock. In the beating of a wing, he found himself inextricably tangled in the long, shaggy fleece and lay there flickering and peeping until the farmer came to shear his sheep. When the farmer found the little bird caught up in the wool, he threaded a string through one wing and gave the sparrow to his little son to whirl around his head as a toy. Any fox who thinks he can imitate his brother the wolf is not fit company for a wise young bird like me, said the crow in conclusion. You thought that you could persuade me to fly on ahead of you and spy out an easy supper, but I am young, and my eyes are still as sharp as my beak, and by the law of nature that makes me as high as the eagle, and you as lowly and stupid as the sparrow. May your feathers drop as you fly. May your beak rust. May the eagle overhear your despicable story, you foul-faced, flip-flopping, flea-flying circus, said the fox, and he ground his teeth until they all broke between his jaws. And after a lifetime of cruelty and overeating, the fox ended his days in the city alleyways, scavenging from the dustbins, along with the stray city cats and the black gnawing rats. Chapter 30 The Two Wazirs In the morning, Scheherazade would often see her father standing in the courtyard with a silver tray. It was the tray on which he would one day carry Scheherazade's head to the king when she had at last failed to delight him with a story. The old wazir was as bent with worry as a blade of grass is bent by a wasp. If he raised his hopes, they would be crushed one morning, and so he stood there in the courtyard, hopeless and miserable, and Scheherazade felt his sorrow as if she were carrying it in the folds of her own dress. Even King Sharyar took note, and he was generally as thoughtless of other people's feelings as the Arab is thoughtless of the floating ice at the world's poles. "'Is your father sick, Scheherazade?' he asked one night." "'for lately his face has become as white as leprosy "'and his hands shake whenever he brings me papers of state. "'He has worries,' she said Scheherazade simply, "'but no doubt all that will smile on him again in the future.' "'The king's thoughts seemed to circle the old wazir for several minutes. "'Scheherazade, is it normal for a king's wazir "'to pass his wisdom on to his son "'so that the son can in turn become wazir to the king? "'What will your father do, having only two daughters?' "'I don't know, my lord and master of all wazirs,' she replied. "'But I hope he finds a better solution than the king "'in the story of the two wazirs, who was faced with the same problem. "'Tell me the story, Scheherazade, and perhaps you will be of help to me, "'for it is I who must appoint a successor to your father when the time comes. "'Be my wazir wife. Advise me.' "'There was once a king whose wazir had no sons,' So when the wazir died, the king invited candidates from all over his kingdom to apply for the post of royal wazir. If the light of their intellect shone too dimly, or their past life was dark with some crime or other, if their clothes were too colorful or their imagination too dull, they were sent home with no more reward than the cost of their journey. And soon only two candidates remained, men of the same age, men of the same height, men of the same education, men of the same reputation, men of the same standing in the eyes of Allah. The king could not choose between them. They were as alike in merit as two petals from the same flower. So he asked the same question of both men. Supposing there was a king who found himself obliged to interview candidates to fill the post of royal wazir. He found two of the candidates so equal in merit that he could not choose between them. Advise me, since you would have the position of my adviser, which should I choose? The first applicant replied, "'Why not choose both, your majesty? "'For as the poet says, two heads are better than one.' "'And the second candidate said to the king, "'I would advise you to appoint both men, my lord, "'for as the poet says, why keep one dog "'when your kennel is big enough for two? 
The king was delighted with their answers and immediately employed both men to be his wazirs. When they were introduced, the wazirs took an immediate liking to one another. "'I can see that we shall be marvelous friends,' said one. "'Our lives will hold hands like dancers in a ring.' "'No doubt about it,' said the other. "'We shall be like two gloves on the king's hand, "'you on his right and I on his left.' "'I, I dare say,' said the first, "'that our lives will now follow the self-same pattern. "'We shall both marry ladies of the court "'and live in neighboring apartments of the palace.' "'This kindred lifestyle so appealed to the second wazir "'that he said, "'I promise you, friend, that I shall not even marry "'unless our weddings can be on the very same day.' "'In that case,' cried the first wazir, "'who was fast becoming his farm friend, "'our sons will be conceived at the same moment "'and born on the same day.' "'With ecstatic delight, the second wazir "'took up the story of their future lives. "'Our sons, our sons will both marry ladies of the court, "'and we shall arrange their weddings for the self-same day, "'and then, having seen our children well settled in life, "'we can light our pipes from the same candle, "'grow old in the same hour, "'and die within the mean breathing of one breath.' I shall see to it that when my son becomes wazir in my place, he finds a comfortable and well-paid job for your son. Pardon? said the first wazir. Did you say, when my son becomes wazir, he will find your son a comfortable and well-paid job? Not quite, dear friend, smiled the second wazir indulgently, for I can not imagine that the king or his heir would favor your son above mine in the choosing of, of a wazir. "'I can see no reason,' said the first wazir, throwing back his shoulders. "'Why the king or his heir or anyone with judgment would favor your son above mine?' "'Why, because he would be the superior man, O oh, ignorant and short-sighted friend. "'You're not suggesting, surely, that your miserable offspring could possibly stand higher than the shoulder of my handsome, honorable boy?' "'What?' screamed the first wazir. "'Your runt would not pass the elbow of my arrow-sharp spear-tall son and heir, you frog-faced son of a tadpole?' "'If we are to talk of faces,' said the second wazir, "'I can only imagine that any boy born with the evil fate of being your son "'would inherit your evil looks, poor lad. "'I have seen potatoes with better eyes and prunes with a better skin. "'I'm not staying here to listen to the growling of a three-toed sloth like you,' "'ranted the first wazir, "'and no son of mine will come within a thousand miles of smell of your children. "'I shall see to that.' "'And he stormed out of the palace in a passionate rage.' which did not cool until his camel had galloped into the upper rift and forgotten the taste of Arabian water. When only one wazir woke the king with the chant of prayers and with respectful greetings, the king asked, "'Where is my other wazir?' The remaining one took great delight in recounting the whole quarrel, word for word, but his voice faded to a silence as he saw the king's face darken with fury. "'Go to your camel and pack your bags,' cried the king, trembling like a tree in heavy rain. "'For you advised me to employ the both of you, "'and now I see that your advice might be as bad as your temper "'and your counsel as sour as your pride.' "'When King Shariar heard the story of the two wazirs, "'he said to Scheherazade, "'I sometimes think, when I hear your stories, "'that your father should name you his heir to the robe of authority "'so that you become the royal wazir when he dies.' "'Alas, my lord,' she replied jokingly, "'despite my youth it seems that I shall be dead "'long before my father the wazir, "'or I might prove to the men of Sasan "'that an ignorant woman is often wiser than a clever man.' "'Then, unaccountably, a large ache appeared in the heart of Shariar, "'and he could not smile at Scheherazade's joke.'" Chapter 31 The Two Lives of Sultan Muhammad Chapter 31 The Two Lives of Sultan Mahmud King Shariar remained so melancholy during the next days that his courtiers realized how many clouds Scheherazade had previously lifted from over the royal palace of Sasan. He sat in his throne with his head in one hand and seemed neither to hear nor see the babble of voices, the herd of faces that streamed past him in the audience chamber. No suits were satisfied, no judgments were given, the whole routine of the court fell into disorder. Finally, the king's wazir became so concerned for the king's health that he went to his daughter, Scheherazade, and said, "'Dearest daughter, wife of my king, can you tell us any reason for the king's latest gloom? For indeed it seems that all the music has left his soul, and sudden autumn has stripped the heart of his, the tree of his heart of all its leaves.' "'Oh, I am lower in his esteem than any prisoner who sits in prison waiting for the day of execution. "'I simply wait outside prison,' said Scheherazade. "'But if I can, I shall devise a story tonight which will change his mood for the better.' 
A funny story to make him laugh? asked her father. I think not, replied Scheherazade, for a man is for if a man is melancholy, laughter is as far from his heart as land is from a drowning man. A sad story, then, to use up all of his tears? suggested the wazir. Certainly not, Scheherazade answered. For what danger will I be in if the king becomes one shade darker, one frown more melancholy? I shall tell him the story of a melancholy king who learned to appreciate his boundless good fortune. Scheherazade began. When, queen, when King Ratafia of Rif was born, Allah heaped on him every good fortune a man could wish for. His wit and good sense were housed in the most handsome of heads. His health and energy were housed in a tall and agile body. His wife's gifts as a cook, a hostess, a musician, and a writer of love poems were only surpassed by her beauty. And her beauty, in turn, was only surpassed by that of his three little babies, two sons and a daughter. During his reign, the walls of his chancery were demolished and rebuilt to make room for the vast quantity of gold and silver coin that represented his wealth. The stables were rebuilt because all the royal mares fold and the royal herd tripled in size. All the members of his staff were, without exception, honest, loyal, and dedicated, for they knew that King Ratafia was loved by every subject in his widespread kingdom of the reef. In short, King Ratafia had everything, and there can hardly be a man who has heard of his good fortune and not envied his happiness. Did I say happiness? Uh, no, one thing was lacking. King Ratafia did not have the ability to enjoy all that he owned. For long days at a time, the king would be plunged into the blackest of depressions. He would sit in his throne, his head in one hand, sighing sighs until the windows of the palace were all clouded. He would kick his wazir in the shins and shout at his wife if she kept him waiting for as much as a third part of a second. If he played with his children and made them laugh, he would complain that they were too noisy. If he refused to play with them and made them cry, he would complain of their noise. During one of the king's blackest moods, a strange visitor came to the palace. He inspired such respect that at the sight of him all the courtiers and officials fell back. No one barred his path to the king. If anyone had guessed his age, it would have been measured in hundreds of years. He had a beard which had never seen a razor or scissors, and he wore it wrapped around his body in place of clothes. Swathed like this in his beard, he approached the king's throne, but did not make the customary bow of obeisance. Instead, he took the king by the wrist and pulled him toward the window. Now the throne room was situated in a high tower that had four windows overlooking the whole city. From the first, there was a fine view of the palace moat. From the second, a view of the city. From the third, a view of the Nile. And from the fourth, a prospect of gardens and parkland. But when the strange old man threw open the first window, the king ducked down below the sill, for he saw an army of men in the very act of storming his palace. Catapults were showering boulders against the walls. Men in chain mail were throwing across the moat grappling hooks, which clutched and clawed at the masonry. Battering rams were splintering the doors of the keep, and a sleet of arrows was driving against the face of the building. "'Alert the army! We are under attack!' cried the king. But no one seemed to believe him, for all of the courtiers and officials stood by. Not one of them made a move. The gnarled old man slammed the window shut and dragged the king by the wrist to the second. But as he opened it, the reeking stench of smoke scorched the king's nostrils and the glow of fire lit up his whole city buildings were crumbling into dust like the ashes of a smoldering log fire his own bronze statue was melting into a shapeless mass from which a river of molten bronze flowed into the gutters shreds of burning cloth blew this way and that in the air raining down soot on the heads of a thousand citizens as they fled their burning houses screaming for help "'Carry the horse troughs to the city! "'Tear down the blankets off every bed! "'My people's homes are burning down! "'Will no one help them?' "'But no one among the king's courtiers or officers "'went to their assistance. "'Slamming the second window shut, "'the rattled old man opened the third "'just in time to reveal the River Nile "'bursting its high banks "'and washing away two cotton farms and a rice paddy. "'Fishing boats were swept prow first "'through the walls of the riverside houses. "'Alligators writhed in the streets, "'devouring those who stumbled about "'trying to escape the flood. "'Throw lifelines from the windows! "'Take the palace doors off their hinges "'and make rafts of them for the drowning to cling to! "'The Nile has burst its banks "'and my people are being washed away. "'Oh, will no one act to help my poor citizens?' "'But no one moved except the grizzly-bearded old man "'who slammed shut the third window "'and opened the fourth. The last place in the palace orangery was shriveling to the size of the last 
Fruit in the palace orangery was shriveling to the size of raisins and dropping from the trees. The trees themselves were nodding and shriveling as the garden prospect was invaded by the blast of the sun, and the scouring sand of the Sahara swept in to swamp the flower beds and bury the lawns. As sand dunes formed in drifts along the palace walls, nests of scorpions broke from every tussock of remaining grass, and knots of black vipers suddenly festooned the bleaching bushes. Locusts carpeted the ground for as far as the eye could see, crackling their bodies and devouring one another when there was no greenery left to devour, and yellow hyenas shrieked with laughter below the window to see the destruction of Sultan Mahmud's parklands and all the surrounding farms. "'Locusts in the desert are swallowing us up!' cried the Sultan. "'Take your hands off me, old man, and help me make these heartless people act to save some lives!' The old man, though he seemed frail, had the strength of ten in his grip. He had no difficulty in dragging the king to the drinking fountain in the center of the room, where he placed a second hand in the nape of the king's neck and plunged his head beneath the water. Down, down, down he went, until seven colors were flashing in his eyelids and the spent air was fluttering in his lungs. The fearsome grip slackened on his neck and arm, and he was released to struggle back to the surface. Up and up he swam arms and legs driving through the water, and he lost consciousness just as his mouth tasted air again for the first time. Washed ashore by the surf, he lay with the strange beach under his back for fully an hour until the sounds of voices stirred him to consciousness. "'Here's a strange fish,' said the peasants who found him. "'What foolish and practical clothes for a working man!' Many unfriendly hands stripped Mahmud of his satin jbala and golden crown and dressed him in a shirt of coarsest yellow sailcloth and breeches of rush roughest hessian. "'I wish the sea had washed up a new donkey,' said one voice as the sultan stumbled to his feet. "'Don't be ungrateful,' said another voice. "'Allah has sent you a foreigner, and foreigners can be made to work almost as hard as donkeys.' "'Where am I?' asked Sultan Mahmud. "'Will no one here treat me with the respect I deserve?' <laughs> "'Yes, indeed, foreign dog, son of a cur. "'I shall use you with the respect you deserve, "'for my donkey died yesterday, "'and I shall set you to work in his place at my mill.' "'Before Mahmud could make anyone understand "'that he was a sultan and the ruler of a great kingdom, "'he found himself trudging around the inside "'of a treadwheel of a flour mill. "'His bare feet grew hard against the splintery wood, "'and it almost seemed that they had been turned into hooves. "'His unkempt hair became so matted with sweat and dirt that it hung down on either side of his head almost like ears. The owner of the mill congratulated himself. Ha! My friends were right. Having a foreigner is almost the same as having a donkey. The miserable Mahmud received only a bucket full of beans to satisfy his hunger and a trow trough of sun-warm water to quench his thirst. Will no one release me from this terrible wheel, he moaned daily. Will no one have pity on a sultan who has been almost changed into a donkey? One day a shepherd boy was passing the mill and heard Mahmud cry out like this. "'Good day, foreigner,' he said. "'Is this kind of work not to your taste?' "'Oh, good shepherd, unfasten me from the wheel or go to my master and plead with him to let me go,' said Mahmud, hanging his panting head through the spokes of the treadwheel. "'I suppose you realize,' said the shepherd, "'that legally only foreigners can be set to work like this. "'And I suppose you realize that if you would no longer be a foreigner "'if you took a local girl for a wife?' "'Oh, fetch me a slave girl, fetch me a milkmaid, fetch me your sister, gentle shepherd, fetch me some woman whom I can marry to escape this terrible work,' begged Mahmud. "'I see that your bad fortunes have brought you a great distance from your native land, for you do not understand the laws in these parts. In order to take a bride, you have only to stand at the doors of the public baths. As each lady comes out, ask her if she is married or single. It is written that Allah will send you the wife of your deserving. The first single woman you question need only say, "'No, sir, I am not married.' and the two of you will be man and wife immediately. That evening, when the mill owner led Mahmud out of the wheel to feed him his bucket of beans, the sultan bolted off across a field and ran all the way to the city, sleeping on the steps of the public baths until late the next morning. The first thing he noticed on opening his eyes was that the women of the country went unveiled. The first female to leave the public baths was a radiant young girl with foaming golden hair falling to below her waist. She smiled encouragingly at Mahmud as he gabbled his words, "'Are you married, child of honey? For if you are not—' "'I married only last week,' she said, and patted his sleeve. "'May Allah send you a fair wife.' "'You are married, aren't you?' he asked the next woman, who emerged in the Turkish baths. She was about his mother's age, with the shape, with the shape of a bag of bricks, and a face as fair as a bowl of a baobab tree. 
I wish I were not, she said, pinching his cheek and winking hugely. I could eat you up, you handsome boy. Are you married? Mahmoud shouted into the shadows of the bathhouse as the next slap of feet approached the doors. The footsteps quickened into a run, and a voice called back, like the call of a baboon through the shadowy rainforest. No, sunshine, light of my future life, let me look at you, my lover, my scrumptious little baby boy, my big masterful bridegroom. No, sir, I'm not married. The head, like an ox, had been joined to the body of a hippopotamus, or so it seemed to Mahmoud, as his bride galloped toward him into the light, with arms spread wide, her, with hair still damp and sticking out in spikes, with face still red from the steam baths, her feet thudded closer like unavoidable fate. As she went to take him in her arms, he ducked underneath her mace-like fists and fled headlong into the hammam. Women in baths screamed and clutched up towels. Masseurs shouted and grabbed at him as he scampered past. Steam swallowed him up, and the slapping of sandals on stone floors pursued him, shouting, Come back, sweetie sugar cake! I don't mind if you look like a donkey! We're married now! Come back, sugar lump! He ducked down a side corridor, which had no end door. So he slipped down a curtain partway along, skidded along the wet floor with flailing arms and a prayer to Allah, and plunged over the edge of a sunken bath full of large pink ladies. Down and down he plunged until seven colors were flashing in his eyelids and the spent air was fluttering in his lungs. The fat pink lady seemed to be holding him under the water with the strength of massive hands, and as recent misfortunes gathered in his memory, Mahmoud wondered if it was even worthwhile to struggle. Lifting the sultan's head after dipping it into the drinking fountain for only a few moments, the bearded old sage called for a chair and seated Sultan Mahmoud while he recovered his breath. Mahmud looked around him with the anxious faces of his wife, children, and courtiers, but they all burst out laughing when he sputtered, "'Where is my hideous wife? Where are all the fat pink ladies? Where are my ears and hooves?' "'Listen, Sultan Mahmud," said the old man, wrapped round in nothing but his beard. "'I have shown you the life you might have led, the twists of fate that might have overturned your happiness, the evil luck which may suffer every day, which many suffer every day. Has the city been saved? Have the flood waters dropped? Has the fire been put out? Have the locusts gone? asked Mahmud, rushing from one window to another to look out over his tranquil kingdom. Those things happened only in your imagination, Mahmud, which I am able to paint as the artist paints canvas, said the old man, lighting a paper spill at the open log fire. But all of them could have happened to you had Allah decreed it. If all and every one of those disasters had fallen on your head, you silly king, then you might have had cause to be sad. But none of them are written in your destiny. Therefore, be happy, or you will shame Allah with your ingratitude for his priceless gifts. A lovely wife, beautiful children, a thriving kingdom, a powerful throne, and a time of peace, and a body more lovely to box up your soul in than the old frame I have to house my magic wisdom. So saying, the gnarled, rattled old man lit the trailing tip of his beard, and a spiral column of green fire burned where his beard had coiled round his body. The green vapor made everybody turn aside to cough, and when they turned back, the old man was gone, and nothing but a scrap of yellow sailcloth lay at Mahmoud's feet. "'I would weep for the loss of a good friend,' he said to his wife as their eyes met. "'But I have banished all tears out of my eyes and banished all my blackness out of the kingdom.' I now declare that any one of my loyal subjects, however lowly their position, is granted the right to banish me, Sultan Mahmud, if I ever sulk, or brood, or mop, or mow, or fail to thank Allah hourly for all the good things life has given me. Come now, there has been much time wasted in moping in moods. I wish it written in letters a hundred inches high all along the palace wall. The Sultan Mahmud is the most fortunate man on Allah's golden earth. And I will fight to the death any stranger who disputes it. As Scheherazade finished the story of the two lives of Sultan Mahmud, she trembled for fear her husband mistook the story for criticism. But his eyes rested on her as a brown bird rests momentarily on a fence and then flies away. I'm sorry, Scheherazade, he said. My ears have delighted in your story like strains of music heard through a wall, but my thoughts have not traveled with your story tonight. I have not been listening. Promise me you will tell me another story tomorrow, and I shall apply my ears to listening. To hear you is to love you and obey, replied Scheherazade, but she shook her head as she walked slowly back to her rooms, and inside her her heart shook of its own accord. <laughs>